Unit one, what are, the what are the philosophical and historical foundations of the American political system? Unit purpose, the people who led the American Revolution, which separated the American colonies from Great Britain, and who created the Constitution, which established the government we have today, were making it a fresh beginning. However, they were also heirs to philosophical and his historical traditions as old as Western civilization. The founders were well read, I cannot live, Without books, Thomas Jefferson once told John Adams, Jefferson's library of approximately 6,500 volumes formed the core collection of the Library of Congress. Adams repeatedly read 43 books during the year. He turned 81 years old. Uh, these Americans were familiar with the history, philosophy, and literature of the ancient world as well as the ideas of their own time. They also studied English history and law, from which their constitutional traditions derived, and Religion was an important part of the Founders' education. They knew the Bible and its teachings. Moreover, the knowledge that these people possessed was not limited to what they read in books. In creating a new nation, they drew on their experiences. Many of the Constitution's framers had fought in the American Revolution and had served in colonial government before America won its independence. They also had experience governing the newly independent states. They used this knowledge and experience when they wrote the Constitution. An understanding of what they learned will help you understand why they wrote the Constitution as they did and why we have the kind of government we have today. This unit provides an overview of some of the important philosophical ideas and historical events that influenced the writings of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. It is particularly important to understand the content of this unit because it provides a frame or reference and a basis for understanding that the other units in this uh, for the other units in this text you will appreciate why our history as a people has been a great adventure in ideas and in trying to make these ideas reality lesson one what did the founders think about constitutional government um, this lesson introduces the basic ideas and experiences the founding generation drew on to create the kind of government they believed would best protect the natural rights of individuals and promote the common good classical Greek and Roman writers, natural rights philosophy, the Bible, Protestant theology, ancient and modern European history, and the Enlightenment in Europe and America were among the sources of the ideas that influenced the founders. The founders also participated in self-government in the American colonies before 1776 and in state and local governments after independence from Great Britain. The founders' ideas about society and government and their experiences were diverse, the colonies differed widely. This diversity fostered a rich dialogue about the purpose of government and how it should be organized. You, get, you have the lesson objectives. When you have finished this lesson, you should be able to do um, and explain these following concepts. And then you've got some vocabulary terms to understand. Constitution, constitutional government, democracy, forms of government, limited government, mixed constitution, parliament, republic, unwritten constitution, and written constitution. What were some characteristics of colonial America? The United States was officially recognized as an independent nation in the Treaty of Paris, 1783, nearly two centuries after the first European settlers landed in America. Once colonies were established, one of the first things the colonists noticed about their new surroundings was their vast size. England and Scotland together were smaller than the present states of New York and Pennsylvania. More than a thousand miles separated the citizens of northern Massachusetts from those of southern Georgia. Uh, of course, the colonists were not the first people on, North, on the North American continent. However, by the end of the Revolutionary War, there were relatively few Native Americans living along the Atlantic coast. Encroachment of colonial settlements, settlements, disease, and warfare significantly reduced the indigenous population on the eastern seaboard, although many Native Americans remained on the western borders of the colonial frontier and beyond. More than physical distance separated the colonists. Their backgrounds were diverse. Some, such as Puritans in Massachusetts and the Quakers in Pennsylvania, came to the New World for religious reasons. Others came for economic reasons. They also differed in social structure and sometimes even language. Pennsylvania, for example, had a large German-speaking population. <clears throat> French and Dutch were important languages in other colonies. A few influential families dominated South Carolina, Maryland, and New York. They owned vast estates intended to replicate European culture and habits as much as they could. By contrast, New England and Georgia had few large estates and partly as a result had different social and political cultures 
than those found elsewhere. Most of the colonies also had established or official government religions. Slavery was practiced in all 13 colonies. Almost all colonial Americans lived and worked on farms in rural communities, but farming meant different things in different places. In South Carolina's coastal region, farming meant using slaves to work plantations that produced rice and indigo for export, mostly to England. Virginia's export crop was tobacco. By contrast, farming in New England meant growing crops and raising livestock for a local market. New England farmers uh, relied less on slaves for labor than did southern colonists, but the New England workforce included thousands of indentured servants, many of whom had entered into work contracts in exchange for transportation to America, food and shelter, or training in various skills. Colonists who did not work on farms followed various trades, working as sailors, shoemakers, silversmiths, and a host of other occupations. Many dabbled in a favorite American pastime, speculating on land. In many ways, colonial America was a society of traditions in which people played social roles and exercised authority in long-established ways, but more than 300,000 people in 1760 were enslaved. These people, or their ancestors, had been transported to North America as captives from Africa. Later lessons will examine the effect of slavery on American constitutional government and culture. Indeed, the British colonies developed a number of different ways of organizing local governments during the century or more of their existence. Next section is how did the founders learn about American government? What did the founders learn about government? And we're going to pause there and you'll want to look back over your, your study guide at this point and see which questions we have answered this far um, in the reading. The founders learned about government from reading history and philosophy and their own experience of self-government as colonists with the British Empire. They were as familiar with ancient Greece and Rome as they were with later European history. Many had read classical texts about government and politics by ancients such as Aristotle, Marcus um, Tilius Cicero, and others. They also had read newer theories of government by 16th and 17th, 16th and 17th century philosophers such as Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. By the 1770s, some were familiar with the English jurist William Blackstone's explanations of English law published between 1765 and 1769. Almost all were well-read in Protestant theology. The founders looked to many examples of good and bad government for guidance. <clears throat> By 1776, Americans also could look back on more than 150 years of experience in self um, in local self-government. Free white men from all walks of life had served on juries, attended town meetings, and voted in local elections. In fact, in the colonies and the early states, more Americans participated in self-government than did people almost anywhere else in the world. Not all the sources that influenced the founders taught the same lessons. Some sources contradicted others. Some did not teach clear lessons at all. For example, classical ancient political philosophers taught that human beings are naturally social creatures with obligations to each other and to their community, without which they could neither survive nor achieve human existence. To Greek philosophers such as Plato, those who govern must be wise. All the classical philosophers agreed that one purpose of government is to help people learn about and perform their civic and moral duties. Greek and Roman history taught that all that although democracies may appear to begin well, they tend to end in tyranny when the poor attack the rich. Class warfare breeds chronic disorder. The people then submit to tyrants who enter the scene promising security. Natural rights theorists taught that people have, an, have natural rights that others must respect. English philosopher John Locke summarized them as rights to life, liberty, and uh, a state. People agree to form a society and create government to protect their rights. The book is correct here, uh, but it's off in that estate is property, but John Locke um, was said, he, he said life, liberty, and property. Thomas Jefferson would later amend um, John Locke by changing property to pursuit of happiness, and that's what we have to this day in the preamble to the Constitution. British history showed that even monarchy, a monarchy, might evolve into free government. If the people are determined, they can ensure that monarchs respect the rights that the people have gained over time. American colonial history showed 
that local self-government could coexist with a distant central authority, in this case, Britain. However, American colonial history also showed that when people believe that the central government is abusing its power, then social and political unrest follows. The founders had many examples of government to choose from in designing their state constitutions and the U.S. Constitution. Why did they make the choices they made? From reading their explanations and documents such as the Virginia Declaration of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and various pamphlets, essays, and letters, it is clear that the founders had learned at least two important lessons about government. Government should be the servant, not the master of the people. A fundamental higher law or constitution should limit government. What forms of government could the founders choose from? <clears throat> the founders were familiar with the writings of Greek philosopher Aristotle, who observed that every state, meaning country or national entity in this sense, must perform three functions. First, states must deliberate, deliberate about what it is to be done and decide what public policy should be. Today we call this the legislative function, deliberating, deliberating on and enacting law. Second, states must perform an executive function through which public officials carry out public policy. And third, states must carry out a judicial function through which disputes about the inter interpretation of law are managed and applied in everyday life. Aristotle also distinguished between types of governments on the basis of the number, number of persons exercising power. Countries may be governed by one person, a few people, or many people. Each of these Three forms of government has a right form and a corrupt form. Right forms are governed for the common good, whereas corrupt forms are governed for the private interests of the rulers. The right form of government by a single person is called a monarchy. The right form of government by a few people is called an aristocracy, or the rule of the best. And the right form of government by many people is called polity. Aristotle referred to polity as a mixed form of government or mixed constitution because it incorporates elements of democracy and oligarchy, which is in the next paragraph. No group of citizens, for example, the rich or the poor, is able to abuse political power. Although a polity is a mixture of social elements, it is most like, it is most like democracy as we define the concept today. According to Aristotle, corrupt forms of government are tyranny, for rule of a single person, oligarchy for rule of a few, usually rich people, and democracy for rule of the many by which he meant the poor. The following table illustrates right and corrupt forms of government as identified by Aristotle. To Aristotle, democracy meant direct democracy in which the people themselves make decisions rather than the type of government we call democracy today, which is largely representative. Aristotle's description of democracy as a corrupt form of government refers to what ancient Greece experienced when the poor, or the many, took power. They attempted to seize the property of the rich for themselves, setting off a destructive civil war, uh, civil wars based on social class. In such cases, the poor looked after only their own interests to the exclusion of the common good. And if you take a moment and look at that table, this is a good place to stop. Look back at your study guide questions and resume this after you have caught up with the questions in the study guide. Although Aristotle classified the government of countries on the basis of their number of rulers, he also focused on economic considerations within countries which usually are far more important. He was especially concerned with the distribution of wealth and the effects that various distributions have on political stability, specifically on the avoidance of civil strife. He concluded that the dominant group of most stable countries consists of those who are neither rich nor poor, but occupy a middle ground of moderate wealth. According to Aristotle, this middle group is known for moderation. Rule by those who are moderate yields the most stable form of government because those of moderate Moderate means are most likely to behave in accordance with reason. In Aristotle's view, the problem with democracy is that the poor, who are numerous, attempt to seize the wealth of the rich, who are few. But if a constitution can combine, mix the many poor with the lesser number of wealthy persons, then it can achieve stability. The founders were familiar with this idea of mixed constitution from reading Aristotle and other writers, such as the Greek historian 
Polybius. Uh, Polybius popularized the idea in ancient in the ancient world that mixed constitution is a combination of monar monarchical, arist arist aristocratic, and democratic elements. This idea, embraced and passed on by Roman statesman Cicero, then became widespread among scholars in the Middle Ages, roughly the 5th century to the 14th century, depending on the country. Though Cicero's great influence in the subsequent period of the Renaissance, the 15th through 17th centuries, the idea of mixed constitution was incorporated into Renaissance political thought and thus into republicanism. It was then passed on to the Enlightenment in the 18th century. For example, the 18th century French political thinker Char Charles Louis II, Baron de la Brede, and Montesquieu cited England as a mixed constitution. The British government had a limited monarch and an aristocracy in one house of parla parliament, the House of the Lords, and in theory, the House of Commons for the common people. In fact, the landed aristocracy dominated the House of Commons, though we were of low rank than the, though they were of lower rank than the members of the House Lords. <clears throat> Montesquieu cited England as an example of a mixed constitution. Is today's government of the United Kingdom a mixed constitution? Why or why not? It's something to think about as we're reading um, through this. Uh, both the British Parliament and the legislatures of colonies were examples of representative government. Representative government sometimes is called republican government. The term republic comes from the Roman term res publica, which is Latin for thing or property of the people. The Roman Republic had an unwritten mixed constitution. Its form of government after 287 BC consisted of executive and legislative branches in which virtually all cases and tribes in Roman society were represented. Based on the founders' reading of history and their personal experiences, they did not believe that direct democracy was the best model for government. It could potentially fail to protect property and the rights, such as, such as rights of minorities. The founders preferred a representative or republican form of government in which many interests can be represented in the legislature and those who govern like ordinary citizens are required to obey the law. What is a constitution? Take a moment and um, check your study guides. Make sure you're caught up with the answers in line with the reading. And then continue. We'll continue. As it is understood today, a constitution is a plan that sets forth the structure and powers of government. Constitutions specify the main institutions of government. In doing so, constitutions state the powers of each of these institutions and the procedures that the institutions must use to make, enforce, and interpret law. Usually, constitutions also specify how they can be changed or amended. In the American conception of, of constitutional government, the constitution is a form of higher or fundamental law that everyone, including those in power, must obey. Many controversies surround written constitutions, including what the words mean, whether the understanding of the document should evolve or remain unchanged, and who should have the final say about what the document means. Nearly all constitutions are written. Only three of the world's major democracies have unwritten constitutions, that is, constitutions that are not single written documents. These are Britain, Israel, and New Zealand. In each of these nations, the Constitution consists of a combination of written laws and precedents. Constitutional government means limited government, government limited by the provisions of the Constitution. Limited government is characterized by restraints on power as specified by the Constitution. In democracies, for example, one restraint is the inclusion of free, fair, and regular elections. The opposite is unlimited government in which those who govern are free to use their power as they choose unrestrained by laws or elections. Aristotle described the unlimited government of a single ruler as tyranny. Today the term autocracy, dictatorship, or totalitarianism often are used to describe such governments. Believing that they had been subjected to tyranny by the British king, the founders also believed that government in the newly independent United States of America should be limited by the higher law of a written constitution. 
How did the founders characterize higher law? According to the founding generation, a constitution should function as a type of higher law. A higher law differs from a law enacted by a legislature in these four ways. It sets forth the basic rights of citizens. It establishes the responsibility of the government to protect those rights. It establishes limitations on how those in government may use their power with regard to citizens' rights and responsibilities, the distribution of resources, and the control or management of conflict. It can be changed only with the consent of the citizens and according to established and well-known procedures. We have critical thinking, another question. How might a government be organized to, pre to prevent leaders from gaining unlimited power? That's still more like critical thinking exercise. What kinds of government may be constitutional governments? The founders knew that constitutional government might, might take many forms. It is possible to have a constitutional government with one ruler, a group of rulers, or rule by the people as a whole, as long as those in power must obey the limitations placed on them by the higher law of the Constitution. Historically, constitutional governments have included monarchies, republics, democracies, and various combinations of these forms of government. The problem for any constitutional government is to ensure that those in power obey constitutional limits. History provides many examples of rulers who ignored constitutional constitutions or tried illegally to increase their personal power. The founders believed that direct democracy was more likely to ignore constitutional limits than representative government. Direct democracy makes it easy for momentary passions to inflame people and leads to passionate rather than reasoned judgments. The interests of the community, as well as the rights of individuals in the minority, may suffer as a result. We have some um, critical thinking questions and um, some questions that will uh, make sure that you are understanding the lesson and um, they would be good for review. Make sure you've completed all of your study guide questions and that concludes this lesson.